Hello folks, welcome to Holding On With Holder, my brand new interview show where I will be discussing important topics with interesting people. My name is Steve Holder and I will be your host. Today I'm talking with Dust James who self-identifies on his Facebook page as a trucker, biker, family man, and communist. Welcome to the show Dust and thank you for being my first guest. I'm very glad to be here. Um, Steve, and I, I really enjoyed interviewing you um, during your independent um, campaign. And I think you brought a lot of good ideas, a lot of progressive and populist positions, and I'm very glad to be here. And yes, I am a family man. I have, you know, I have a wife and a young son, and I'm proud to support, work hard, support my family as a truck driver, and I love the trucking industry. I love uh, jamming gears, getting down the road, living on the road. Um, I'm also a biker. I like, um, I'm not big on Harleys. I like Japanese muscle bikes. I really like the performance and, and not have to do so much maintenance on them because I work all the time. You know, uh, I got a Yamaha uh, Raider 1900 goes from zero to 60 in 3.6 seconds. Um, I like to wear vintage biker gear. Um, you know, the brown suede jacket with the tassels, um, cowboy boots. Um, and I love, I love to get on my bike and ride long distances um, up to the mountains, down to the coast. And I'm also a communist. And my position on communism is I love my neighbors. I love my community. I love my country. I want to build up my country. I want my country to be a better place. And I believe that capitalism is holding us back. Capitalism is causing poverty. Co capitalism is causing war. And I want us to live in peace and prosperity. Well, that sounds very good. And that leads right into our questions. And the first one I'm gonna ask you is, what is social, socialism? Most people have no idea. We hear a lot about it. Don't uh, TV from people that really don't know what they're talking about sometimes. So what exactly is socialism? Socialism is a mode of production. Um, scientific socialism in particular um, is a specific type of socialism. Um, socialism is basically the means of production being organized to serve the collective good. That's what socialism is. But Marxism or scientific socialism is a specific type. Other types of socialism are utopian socialism or religious socialism. Um, scientific socialism is where you understand the world from the material data. And then from, from history, you can understand the present and, and try to predict the future. And in this model, um, basically, there's modes of productions. Modes of productions are the way society is organized. And the modes of production start as first humanity started with hunter gatherer societies, where, pe where human tr bands or tribes of human beings would, you know, gather fruit and hunt animals. Well, it's a very hard life. And there's not a lot of time for art or culture. And an, an evolution past that. Um, was actually the slave society when the introduction of the agricultural revolution. This is a change in the material conditions and this change is our society. So the agricultural revolution brought on the slave society and the slave society uh, allowed human beings to have larger societies, to have specialties, um, to advance in mathematics and, and science and political government. But it was a very oppressive system. And because it was a very oppressive system, it was inefficient. Um, what is the incentive for a slave to work? You either get beat up or killed or work. So a better system than the slave system was the feudal society. In the feudal society, you had peasants. And peasants were basically belong to the land and they would pay a certain portion of their profits to the landlord. So they actually had a little bit to work for and a little bit to work forward to because they could save a little bit of their stuff and do with, with it as they will. 
that was feudalism. And after feudalism came capitalism. And capitalism made huge advancements in human society, in art, in mathematic, in human, in, in human structures. And the next coming form of mode of production is socialism. Um, right now, capitalism helped improve our conditions greatly. Um, like compared to feudalism, capitalism is great. And that's the way socialism is going to be. Right now, capitalism is inefficient. Capitalism is trying to hold back history. Um, capitalism in its current stage is imperialism. And imperialism is a system where a few oligarchs, banking cartels, um, for the most part, oil companies in the first world, in the imperialist camp, Europe, London, Wall Street, the United States is, is its head leader. It's actually holding back the global South from further developing. They're keeping the global South in poverty, stopping them from developing. Um, I think the lead force for socialism in the world today is China. And what China does with its, with its trading partners, it offers win-win trade. It doesn't go in there and say, if you don't do this, we're going to install this kind of government. It actually helps build up its trading partners. And there was actually, believe it or not, um, that there was actually plans for types of win-win trade in the United States. Um, similar, but the oligarchs in the United States held back that process, held back that progress. And socialism is going to come eventually. Um, it's just maybe we can, as socialists, we try to help it come along a little bit faster. Um, we try to put, we try to spread. There's this idea of base and superstructure. Base is the economic conditions that creates our reality. Superstructure is the politicians. It's the rhetoric. It's the ideas. The base creates the superstructure, but the base is pushing people to become disillusioned in the capitalist system. People are, are looking for answers. And right now there's only, there's only two real answers, socialism or barbarism, meaning we can push forward or we can try to bring back the past. And that is what you see with the reactionary right, um, the religious right, um, the Trump movement. They're trying to maintain and hold their position within capitalism when society is moving forward. And human beings work together better than we do individually. They say that two oxen can do the work of four. And it just makes more sense. And it's, it's going that way. But when you start involving international politics and government, it, it's, it may seem to get complicated. But in reality, socialism is rather simple. We help each other and create a better world. Interesting. So how exactly does socialism differ from communism? People seem to think those are exactly the same things, but there is a difference, correct? I'm, I, based on the way you stated that question, um, people, can, people may consider that the social Dems are socialist or Bernie Sanders is a socialist. I don't consider them socialists. Um, I don't consider them socialists because they're not advocating for planned economies. They're not advocating for the seizure of the means of production. They're still operating within capitalism, but with more human with more concessions and more health care. What I'm to me, socialism is when a whole nother class takes power. Right now, the bourgeoisie and the capitalists are in power. Socialism requires the working class, the proletariat, to come into power and organize society in a way that benefits the people. Um, so, I was, oh, so right now, you, might, you may seem like, oh, society now isn't planned, or the economy isn't planned. It's simply based on the profit motive. But I would say that these large scale corporations, our economy is planned, but who is doing the planning? The planning is being done in CEO boardrooms for the benefit of shareholders. That's how it's being planned. So you can't tell me that it, just the free market and chaos um, is, is leading to economic growth. That's not, what, that's not what happens. That's libertarian, 
utopianism and it doesn't exist in reality. Everything is planned. So socialism would be instead of these corporations planning the economy and banks investing for profit, we the people own the banks. We the people um, control the major aspects of industry. Now I'm not in favor of, of you know, the government owning everything. I think the public's, the, the consumer goods industry, the service industry, that can be left to the market. You know, but I'm talking about the main staples of the economy, banking, energy, timber, steel, these have to be planned. Um, these have to be done, the main structures of the economy have to be done in a way that helps the people. Um, so what I would say is we need a government that's controlled by the people through democratic processes. Every form of socialism has had a community control over it. In the Soviet Union, it was called the Soviets. The Soviets were workers' councils and community councils that were on the ground, gave input to the larger body. Um, in Venezuela, you have the colectivos. In, the, in communist China today, you have the 90 million member communist party, which, which has members in every local community. And this gives input to the larger planning body. And then, and especially today with the digital revolution, where we have all this data at our fingertips, we can plan our industry. We can, we can own the banks and loan the people that are investing in new green technology instead of the oil companies. We can build in a way where we don't waste as much. And we can build our economy in the way to eliminate poverty and have that as a goal in our government. Um, I think we need a government of action to fight for working families. Okay. Now, now, and as far as socialism, uh-huh. That makes now, sense. Can you explain <laughs> the differences of the different kinds of socialism? I know, like you mentioned, uh, Bernie Sanders, you know, that's, uh, that's what a lot of people think of nowadays. But explain the different types of socialism, if you will. Yes. Um, so... So basically the difference, well, you, I did actually didn't answer the last question. Um, the difference between socialism and communism is simple. Socialism is a transitionary period from capitalism to communism. Communism is a stateless, classless society. Um, and it sounds really far off and utopian, but it's not. Um, basically to get to communism, you would need a level of abundance. You would need so much material wealth that people could do as they wanted, work as they wanted, take as they wanted. Um, that would, that's communism, but that's years, if not hundreds or thousands of years into the future. Socialism is required as a transitionary step. So basically we need a dictatorship of the proletariat. And that sounds really scary. But essentially what we have now in the United States and the capitalist countries is a dictatorship of the capitalist. Um, we have a little bit of stability and they act like we have democratic rights, but we don't. When it comes down to the real decisions, we are kept out of the decisions. We are rank and file members of the Democrat and Republican party that do not take in our input. We need socialist collective organizations to tell the government what to do, and we don't have those. We need to build that. Now, what that's going to look like, I don't know. Now, the different types of socialism over the years, I'm a Marxist-Leninist. I'm a scientific socialist. I honor the, the accomplishments of Mao and Stalin, and they have done great things. Um, Stalin led the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union um, had great accomplishments. We've been told this lie, that socialism has failed everywhere it's been tried. And the, and the truth is the exact opposite. Socialism has, has achieved great accomplishments everywhere it has been implemented. The Soviet Union was the most backward country, country in Europe. Um, it, was, it was basically a, a semi-feudal society. It was the sick man, uh, well, China was the sick man of Asia, and arguably the Soviet Union was the sick man of Europe. Um, it had a czar. Um, people would die regularly from famines before the industrialization. 
So under, under Stalin and under the Soviet Union, they were able to become an industrial superpower within a few decades, defeat the Nazis, and invent space travel. Now, let's talk about the different forms of socialism. So a lot of, there's been a lot of propaganda against the Soviet Union, against China. We have been told they're evil, they're mass murderers, they committed all these crimes. And I'm not going to sit here and deny any of the crimes of those countries. But on, if you compare them with the United States or any other country, their, their, their crimes are actually less. If you look at the genocide of the United States, just being in political power, um, you're, you're bound to make mistakes. Um, there's bound to be horrible things. That's, that's the nature of politics and political power. I'm not a utopianist. I'm a realist. Um, I'm not a liberal. I'm a communist, and there's those, <laughs> those are, are, are very different things. So Trotskyism, Trotsky was somebody who was dissatisfied with the Soviet Union, and essentially, I believe he worked with the Nazis and betrayed the Soviet Union, and because of all the anti-communist propaganda, Trotskyism became a thing all over the world, and then you have Eurocommunism, which is, it's basically because of all the anti- the propaganda against the communist states, all these other forms of communism developed to say, hey, social, um, every time the CIA is telling you about um, the Soviet Union, China is true, but I'm an, a real socialist and that bad stuff's not going to happen. Um, I bite the bullet head on. They had issues, they had problems, but they tried to implement something positive. And when socialism comes to the United States, it's going to come in a way that the people want. It requires the masses of people to take power to create socialism. So I believe the socialism in the United States will be fundamentally more democratic. But these forces that go around and calling themselves democratic socialism are usually in league with the imperialist and the capitalist, and they don't support the independent anti-imperialist countries. So what would you say to the biggest myth about socialism? Is it the propaganda that you're talking about, how it's failed in every place it's been tried? Or is there another bigger myth than that? I think that is the biggest myth. And uh, there's also other myths. There's also myths like, I don't like them damn socialists because they're all lazy and they all live in the city and all this. Or a lot of times... In the United States, socialism is associated with cultural wars, the ur urban and rural divide. And in reality, socialism has nothing to do with the, the cultural wars. The more socially conservative folks in rural areas, the more socially liberal folks in the cities, socialism has nothing to do with that. Socialism has to do with the working class. So given the current confines in the United States, the political situation. I think we need to make a bridge between the working urban work, ur the urban working class and the rural working class. The emblem on the Soviet Union is the hammer and sickle. The hammer was to represent the industrial working class and urban areas. And the sickle was the unity amongst the, the peasants and the rural workers of the time. And I think if we want working class power, we got to get through um, these cultural divides that they, they, they divide us. So you got Democrats that, you know, they, they, they seem to be in favor of civil rights. They're in favor of LGBT issues. And then you have um, Republicans that come off as, um, you know, we're about the good and the family and, and positive things that appeal to rural work. Um, and I, and they keep, and then they do horrible things. They never get their good accomplished, their, their, their good promises accomplished. We never get um, single payer healthcare, socialized medicine. We never get uh, education. We never get um, daycare programs, free daycare. All we get is constant wars, exploitation, lowering wages. And then they convince, hey, it was the Republican voter of why you don't have what you should have. It was the democratic voter of why you shouldn't have. Um, my slogan is workers unite. 
Um, and that requires breaking through the myth of the rural urban divide. The real divide is the worker and the capitalist. Yeah, I agree with you. Now on a more personal note, Dust, what convinced you to become a socialist communist? That's, 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 <laughs> that's very good. You know, I, I'm, I'm not someone culturally that you would associate um, with communism. Um, I'm a country boy. Um, I came from upstate New York. I mean, people say New York and that's like, uh, you think the city, but nah, there's places up in upstate New York that are more rural than, uh, than down here in North Carolina. You know, I moved down to North Carolina when I was like five years old. You know, my, my parents listened to country music. I lived down a mile long dirt road with eight people in a two bedroom trailer. Um, and you know, I was picked on in school for not having the right clothes or this or that. And, you know, and I got along more with black folks and Mexican folks than, you know, some of the more, you know, people would say, you know, Southern, Southern, the, the, the petty bourgeois Southern folks with the big trucks and mama bought the stuff. <laughs> but I became disillusioned. I became friends with people in the immigrant community. And I realized people in the immigrant community are, are mistreated. They're undocumented. Um, our African-American brothers, sisters are more likely to be harassed by the cops. They're first fired. They're discriminated against. And, and then I looked at the working class. I, the working class and how we're exploited and how we're mistreated. I became disillusioned. Um, so, you know, I got more into progressive politics. And I was, my dad actually had a little bit of Quaker roots to him and he was a bit of a pacifist and we weren't allowed to watch war movies. Um, so I also had uh, an anti-war position. And in 2003, when they invaded um, Iraq um, in high school, I would war, and I was actually a Christian. I was a very strong Christian. I would, had very deep religious beliefs. And I started out as like an anarchist Christian, you know, that believed in peace and humanity. And I wrote a, I wrote a, I wrote a letter called, I wrote this kind of like short page manifesto called all, meaning if you don't consider all of humanity to be, to be your brothers and sisters, as, as Jesus said, then what you're supporting isn't in line with the teachings of Christ. And I went around and I posted that all essay on all the churches in my community. Needless to say, the cops showed up at my house because <laughs> I felt, you know, I was like Martin Luther. But then when I got into college and I started organizing, um, I thought the biggest injustice in the world is the imperialist wars. And it is. Um, the society we live in today, the global economic system is imperialism. Imperialism where a few bankers and oil companies control the whole world economy. And if a country doesn't conform to their will, they destroy that country. They sabotage that country. They invade that country. They leave countries in chaos and in poverty and starvation. And, and chaos creates rape and crime and, and, and life that isn't even worth living. Um, the biggest war crimes in Yemen and Libya. Yemen, there's, 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 there's mass genocide um, and starvation children um, with their ribs poking out and dying because the U.S. is backing the Saudi Arabia um, because so they can get oil and they can control the oil markets. So Saudi Arabia is killing these people and it's U.S. Uh, money and our taxpayers funding the fuel the war planes. And as a Christian, and I think every human being is a brother of mine. Every person was made in the image of God and they're equal to me. I cannot have that. I must do something. I must stand for that. And that's why I put the picture of John Brown behind me, who was a Christian, who, who had similar ideas about no human being should be held in slavery. And I feel the same way. No human being should face the conditions of imperialist war. And so I first got involved in, I did an internship with the American Friends Service Committee, and I did it for counter-recruitment to convince working people to not join the military and, and basically kill poor black and brown folks for our class enemies. 
the imperialist, the capitalist. And I said, if you, if you join the military, um, you, will be, um, you will be deployed, you could get PTSD, you might be killed. And what you're doing is, help, is not defending this country. When you join the military, you're not defending this country because this government isn't, isn't there for the benefit of this country. It's there for the benefit of these few capitalists. And then it was in the anti-war movement. The most militant anti-war fighters are the communists. And it's always been that way. Lenin, um, the, the, the Soviet revolution, the Russian revolution, the slogan that won the revolution was peace, land, and bread. Because the people were tired of World War I. And it was there that I was trained by people with, by older comrades. Um, whose parents integrated, uh, had the first integrated unions in the South, the first um, black and white side-by-side -side solidarity in the South were organized by communists. And it was a son of one of those labor organizers who, who taught me communism. And I was taught communism in a very respectful way. These folks were in their 70s. I'd go, I'd go to their house, we'd drink tea, listen to classical music, study history, study politics, think about what power we have and how we can use it to benefit our community. Now, these people, did they convince you to become a Marxist? Uh, why are you a Marxist as opposed to some other kind of socialism? It was, it was seeing the love of the people. Communist workers are the best people you will ever meet. They work hard. Um, they, they work hard and they try to get um, food for their family, house for their family and shelter for their family. And then they take energy on top of that and invest it with, with no hope of return not being paid, no hope of return, invest hours and hours and hours of their time to study and organizing. And it, the communists have been the most effective organizers. Communists led the anti-war movement. Communists led the labor movement up into the McCarthy era. Um, and they've, had the, they've done the most good for people. That's the material conditions. So Jesus said, um, you'll know, you'll know, judge someone based on their fruits or they produce or their actions. And I have noticed that communists have had the best results of, of improving the lives of working people. Um, and Malcolm X um, said, um, was, was a pragmatist. And he's basically whatever, whatever works, any means necessary, whatever works we should implement. And I, can, I have studied history and I've studied material conditions and I'm thoroughly convinced those who operate on the understanding of scientific socialism have the tools to get the most done for the working class. And, I, and that is my main goal. I want my son to have a better life than I have. I want my community to have a better life and I want the world to have a better, to have a better world and a better life and better material conditions. Yeah, well, that's a good goal. Now, I know that socialists and communists really have a bad image in the United States. Have you personally been discriminated against or talked to in a very <laughs> abusive way or do people spread rumors about you? And, you know, the normal capitalist response to socialists and communists, how has that affected you personally or has it? <sighs> That's, that's, that's a hard question. Um, it all goes, so if you go to most capitalist countries in the world, there is a local communist party. Maybe there's se several different socialist or communist parties. But the, in the imperial core, in the United States, the lead imperialist capitalist country, they have destroyed the socialist and the communist movement. Um, the, the parents of the people who trained me in communism were taken out of their houses, tortured, uh, made to give up names in, in supposedly a free country. I, I figured we, could ha we, we should be able to vote and openly promote whatever ideology and understanding we can, but that's simply not the case. There's been brutal repression of, this, of the communist movement. 
And I think on the, on the laws to this day, if you are an open communist, you are not allowed to leave um, the labor movement. So a lot of people are underground communists um, where they're not openly publicly communist. They're openly progressive um, because of the retaliation and the propaganda that they receive. Now, um, I recently started doing these YouTube videos and I've been openly and publicly communist. And I think, even though I don't think Bernie Sanders is a socialist, because of the worsening economic conditions and because the new generation doesn't buy the lies um, about socialism, socialism doesn't have the, isn't such a bad word to the youth. And I'm sticking my neck out and I'm saying I'm publicly a communist. Um, and I've done a lot of it online. Um, but I mean, I have talked with workers and came out is a socialist. And if I tell them that I'm in it for the good reasons and I'm right beside them, I speak the same language they do. I watch the same movies they do. I'm your worker. I'm right beside you. Some people are communists. Get over it. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's about all I got to say. Okay. Okay. So you say the socialism is a step between capitalism and communism. So how you briefly mentioned that, that transition, but can you give a little bit more detail? How do we get from where we are to the ideal of socialist or communist system? How does that exactly play out? How I do actually, we get there from here? I actually prepared a, a quote from the Communist Manifesto that, that details this in very short, and I'll, I'll explain it. Um, there's a short quote from the Communist Manifesto. The proletariat will use its political supremacy to wrest by degree all capital from the bourgeoisie to centralize all instruments of production in the hands of the state, i.e. the proletariat, organized as the ruling class, and to increase the total productive forces as rapidly as possible. So a key word in this, so basically, um, history has moved forward within contradictions. There is a thesis and then problems with that thesis um, create an antithesis. The antithesis um, comes into contact with and rests with the thesis until you have a synthesis. Um, a synthesis is the, new, is the new society and it's already happened before. Um, you had feudalism, um, uh, feudal conditions are horrible. Nobody has any um, democratic rights. There is, you know, science is repressed. So there was groups within that were dissatisfied. And then they came against and contacted. And what we got was the world today. And I think a, a good portion of this quote is by degree. So if you notice, I'm not saying we should immediately, the government should immediately take power and take over everything and implement this and that, I think there has to be a switch from power. You can't just implement reforms and eventually get to socialism. There has to be a switch from the power of the capitalist to the proletariat. But then when the proletariat, the working class, us, the people, I know I'm using these complicated words, proletariat. All the proletariat is us. Um, Fred Hampton, um, has a great quote. If you're afraid of socialism, you're afraid of yourself because socialism is the people. Um, so by degree. So by degree would mean first we'd start off with the major institutions, um, the banks. The banks are the ones destroying the world right now. I, yeah. I don't care if you're left or right. We have to have people control over the banks. And if we had people control over the banks, we could stop all the investment in fossil fuels, stop all the investment in the war. Um, but it's going to take, we can't just like put this on a ballot initiative and then send that off and then all vote on that because the capitalists man manipulate the so-called democratic system. Uh, to get that, we need to build workers' power. We need to take power from the capitalists, return it to the people. 
is the Black Panther saying, power to the people, all power to the people. We need a government of and for and by the people, isn't it? <laughs> and, yeah. and that's essentially it. I think, honestly, um, if you truly want to, if you truly want to implement the progressive image of the founding fathers of the United States, you need socialism. You can't do it with capitalism. Capitalism. We have to work together and, and build our society. And that, so that's it. So the, the people control the state. The state organizes the resources for the benefit of the people. And also increase the productive forces as rapidly as possible. And that's an important thing. You can't have socialism in poverty. Um, socialism requires to develop an abundance. The more, usually everyone says that, oh, um, socialists are poor and they're authoritarian. The reason why socialist countries have had to implement authoritarian systems is because of poverty, because they've come from the third world and because they've been exploited. The way to get out of authoritarianism and become a more democratic society is stability and prosperity. And, the, and it's funny that the United States and Europe is like the beacon of, of, of democracy. When it's causing the third world to be in poverty and stops them from having democracy. So our democracy in the United States is fake. It's predicated on the exploitation. If we want a, a democracy, a stable system that's not predicated on theft, we have to implement socialism. We have to stand in, in shoulder to shoulder in solidarity with, with the, the oppressed third world and become full human beings and work together cooperatively. And the only people stopping us are these handful of people, this 1% of a 1% of, of bankers yeah, big, um, yeah. that control, <laughs> even more than billionaires, even the billionaires are pawns uh, of this few five families that really control the world. Uh, well, one last question, Dust. You've really, really given me an education. I'm sure anybody that sees this also will feel the same way. What one person, if there is one person, really influenced you to get to where you are today with your beliefs about socialism and communism and about the economic system? Uh, one person, you got to put it down. Uh, there's, there's tons of, of great people who have stood on the shoulders of other great people. I would, I would say it would be Jesus. And it would have to be the, the Sermon on the Mount. The least of us, um, I don't remember. So the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Um, that's basically, that was basically the core of, so I, I'm not an, well, as far as religiously, you know, I'm not very religious, but I'm not exactly an atheist. There's some kind of force and some kind of power. What pushes me to get up in the morning? What pushes me to wake up on Sunday morning instead of sleeping in and doing this interview after I've already done an interview at two o'clock last night? Um, what pushes me to do that? And that's my love of humanity. And I think Jesus was, was the pure exam, purest example of that. Well, I was not expecting that answer. I like that. I like that. Uh, well, thanks, Dust, for being on. Again, I'm very, very honored that you would uh, agree to be my first guest on this show. And uh, I, maybe we'll do it again sometime. So uh, maybe we can get into some real deep, deep stuff. And uh, again, thank you. Thank you very much. I will say goodbye and let you go. And I will put this on YouTube and Twitter and Facebook. And hopefully you can get your message out to a lot of people. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, sir.